Hide your kids. Lock the doors. You're listening to HR's most dangerous podcast. Chad Sowash and Joel Cheeseman are here to punch the recruiting industry right where it hurts. Complete with breaking news, brash opinion, and loads of snark. Buckle up, boys and girls. It's time for the Chad and Cheese Podcast. Oh, yeah. Nachos and lemon heads on my dad's boat. Hey, kids, you are listening to the Chad and Cheese Podcast. This is your co-host, Joel Brennan Cheeseman. And this is Chad Mambo number five. So wash. And on this week's show, job boards have a prompt problem, employers have a big brother complex, and LinkedIn has a weirdness issue. Mm. Let's do this. Hospitality is the heart of our society. It brings people together to share great food, drinks, and experiences. But successfully managing a restaurant or hotel is no easy feat. That's where Harry comes in. Harry is the frontline employee experience platform that helps you build, manage, and engage great teams. With Harry, managers can easily find and hire top talent, manage timekeeping, and communicate with employees at any time from any place. Candidates and team members can quickly and efficiently apply for jobs, swap shifts, and access important information entirely from their mobile devices. And Harry's robust employee engagement tools make team members feel more connected than ever. With Harry, as an owner or operator, you get a bird's eye view of your business. From turnover cost, labor cost, employee sentiment, compliance risk, and team performance. Run your business better by understanding the power of your people. Because when your team is the heart of your business, Harry is the heartbeat. See how it transforms your business. All right, dude, you, you and Burson, what's, what the hell? You and Burson are at each other. Uh, jousting online, what's going on? No, 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 no. Just I, I just had to challenge his bullshit. So, okay, so <laughs> after last week's show, um, a listen, uh, a listener forwarded me a tweet mm-hmm. from Josh Burson's Twitter account, and Burson's messaging was totally anti-union yep. and anti-worker. So I took a screenshot, posted it on LinkedIn with a few choice words, and I got a <laughs> shit ton of of activity on the DM side. Right, uh-huh. which was I thought was was incredibly weird, and Josh even uh, DM'd me. He said he would love to hear more about the UAW wage issue, and then he points to two articles in the Atlantic that he's uh-huh. using for like a base of reference, not not data points, not BLS, not wage calculators, but a couple of fucking articles. So anyway, uh-huh. I was like, and then he asked me where I got mine from. I'm like, dude, give me a fucking break. <laughs> you're you're a global analyst, right? BLS uh-huh. data, wage calculators. There are tons of of data sourced, well sourced data that's out there. I'm not your fucking research assistant, okay? Uh, okay, guys. Anyways, then no shit. Yep. I get a DM from another listener who asked me if I had heard his last Josh Burson's last uh, podcast episode, which totally trashes the UAW. It's like, oh my fucking God, are you kidding He's me? He's got a podcast? I, yeah, apparently, <laughs> apparently. Ramblings of a crazy man. Anyway, I, I, I hadn't, so I listened to it, and I had to listen to it three times because it was uh-huh. surreal. We have a global industry analyst that sounds like a drunken uncle on Thanksgiving Day. I mean, nothing but lazy, nebulous mentions and, and ba- babblings about nothing. nothing. Then I'm just sitting here. I'm absorbing this. I'm not saying anything. I'm just absorbing it. Uh-huh. Then I get a, then I get tagged in a LinkedIn post by Dr. Kim, which outlined and somewhat trashed the very same podcast episode I was just talking about from Josh Burson. Uh-huh. And let's go ahead and paraphrase Dr. Kim's post. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. (laughs) Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. And I listened to it three times. So therefore, you know, my head was spinning. So I've got to push myself away. But that was it, man. I mean, Uh it's just... You've got these industry leaders who say stuff. They have a pulpit. They have things to say. I totally get that. And 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 I and I understand that. But don't come with this fucking weak sauce, okay? If you're going to have data 
which you uh-huh. should have shit tons of, not your own data because you just manufacture that shit. I'm talking about <laughs> things that real research firms do have, <laughs> take a look at that BLS source data, that kind of thing, wage calculators, MIT, Harvard business review, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Use that and then start to create a narrative around that. And then we can have a discussion, but just the crazy ramblings. I just, I, I, I don't have time for it. I, we're podcasters. <laughs> we're supposed to crazy ramble, right? <laughs> But we come with the fucking data. I mean, it, 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 I just don't yeah. expect that from from guys of his quote unquote cal- caliber. Yeah, and doesn't he have staff to find out some of this stuff for him I anyway? Did, he's got research assistants. Yeah. Most people write the shit for him, for God's like sake. PhD I mean, students which, and I shit get. working for him. I don't. Know. Yeah, it, I, no fucking. <laughs> everybody, this is Chad. Like when he's been in America for too long, and it's time <laughs> to get his ass back to Europe. Like Chad is at ultimate saltiness right now everyone stay clear <laughs> of of pissing chat off because this is what you're going to get you're going to get you're going to get the salt i, poured in the I wasn't mad i just it just it just it's unnerving man and and then all of these people this is the thing that drives me the most crazy people that are afraid to actually speak truth to power and people mm-hmm. see burst in his power i don't i don't fucking get that but they they're, they're afraid to speak truth to power. And there's a lot of discussions that are happening behind the curtain that uh, most people don't hear. So um, unfortunately, we hear a lot of it. I should say, fortunately, we hear a lot of it. But I think, you know, that should be more public discourse than anything else. So Chad, my is. mother, my mother always said the clothes don't get clean without the agitator. And you and <laughs> you and me, my friend, are a couple of agitators, but the clothes won't get clean otherwise. You know what they I'm won't. saying? They won't. Shout out. All right, geez, we spent a lot of time on that. Uh, I got a shout out. Uh, the U.S. News and World Report. Remember mm-hmm. that magazine? I'm sure you subscribed to it back in 2002. Anyway, talking. they're still around, and they just published <laughs> their best HR software of 2023 report. Here's how it broke down for solutions that our audience cares about. All right, best overall technology uh-huh. goes to Rippling. Best budget <laughs> goes to Deal. The best deal is it Deal, if you know what I'm saying, Chad. Uh, best for small businesses goes to Gusto. Best mm. for remote teams, Connect Team. Best recruitment and application tracking goes to Workable. Maybe Jim will win it next year as they're launching an ATS here pretty soon. But that is my first shout out. One. The U.S. News and World Report is still around, so shout out to them. And yeah. secondly, to all the winners of their illustrious best software tools in HR for 2023. <laughs> the worst. I Just love the U.S. and U.S. News and World Report has to come out with a list. <laughs> That's saying something. All right, shout out to bad presentation titles. Companies still can't understand why viewers don't show up to webinars and or their presentations at Mm in-person events. Here's one key factor. Your title sucks. So this week's winner of the worst presentation title goes to, drumroll please. Employ. That's right. Employ with their, quote, Augmenting AI and automation with human ability, striking the balance in your hiring approach. A horrible, godforsaken title. This week's winner is Employ. Now, you might say, be saying to yourself, how can I take such a horribly rambling title and make it better? How can I do that, Chad? That's a very good question. That's the exact same question I asked three of my new AI buddies. Here's their best shot at these titles. Mm-hmm. Chat GPT answered with balancing AI and human skills in hiring. Hmm, nice. Okay. Concise. All right. Our friend Bard's top answer was human centered hiring in the age of HI. Ooh, I or like that too. AI. Yeah, I, right. I do like that one. I like that one a lot. And our new friend Claude, who we're going to talk about later in the show, mm-hmm. uh, came up with human-centered hiring in the age of AI. It's the exact same thing Mm -hmm. as Jack GPT. The only difference is they went with human ability instead of human skills. So people, if you're going to talk about using AI, especially if you're going to do a fucking presentation about it, use AI. 
make your shit better. At least give yourself some options. Mm -hmm. Keep it tight. Just the tip. <laughs> By the way, this, this goes for uh, conference titles for presentations and yes. discussions because oh you and I, as 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 the disruption stage MCs, have have thrown many titles back to people and say, "Fix this shit because it's not going to yeah. work. No one's going to come to this." Bad this thing and that uh that is and don't get similar. mad at me if they don't exactly exactly and if you pay money take extra time to make sure that it's a title that someone come might on. actually might actually come to think of it as clickbait what would make people want to come click find out more uh and go from there well my shout out and this will end our shout outs goes out to dress codes chad <laughs> and looking at me you know i'm one to adhere to the dress codes but the that. senate unanimously that. passed a resolution to reinstate the formal dress code requiring senators to wear business attire on the floor. This comes after Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer told members that he was relaxing the Senate floor's dress code, leading to Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman to embrace his trademark shorts and hoodie uniform within the halls of Congress. Formality does have a place in this world, Chad, and both parties can agree that the halls of Congress is such a place. Shout out for me to dress codes yeah that escalated I, quickly there are reasons for dress codes don't get me wrong but i think one of the things especially in politics today is that we are so divided and and we feel like obviously you know the politicians are in an ivory tower you take a look at, at a guy like john fetterman you don't think that especially when he's in a hoodie and mm -hmm. it's it's almost like throwback to, to to the zuckerberg days right when he was just a developer and that's who he was and that's who he was going to be uh in this case, you know, yes, if there is a uniform, you definitely have to go buy a uniform. You know, if you're in the military, mm -hmm. you've got a uniform. If you're, you know, working for Cintas, you have a uniform, right? There are uniforms. There's no question. Yeah. Um, th the big question for me is, what do we do if it's dress? It can't just be dress, but I think mm -hmm. uh, around being able to, to seem more like a normal human being because politicians don't. They don't. And you know what they could be doing? They could be going to chadcheese.com slash free, mm -hmm. registering for a free t-shirt and wearing Ooh. that on the Senate floor. That now that's something all parties can get behind. I, Chad. I know. Yes. <laughs> Job get would love it, obviously, because yeah. you know they're the sponsor of the t-shirts. The Plus, these guys love alcohol, so they can get mm -hmm. free beer from Aspen Tech Labs. That'd be awesome. Yep. Whiskey. Two bottles of whiskey from Tex Colonel. And if it's your birthday, which it is this week for a very big name that we know, we'll get there soon. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil it, Joel. Rum with plum. You can win. Rum with plum. Really? Can you feel the By the way, Chad, in, speaking in of right dress now? codes, I may or may oh, no, not be I wearing can. pants on this week's show. I'll plum. let you use your Did own not imagination need to know that. for that. Did not need to know that. That's right, folks. Another trip around the sun for some of our biggest fans shout out goes to kevin grossman ling Wu, chuck juanardi yes. leah mcguire brett farmelo gavin lamb andrea derler carla cruck our european brother in podcasting house of hr's levin van neuenhauser yes and last but not least chad stella cheeseman celebrates a birthday this week my daughter nice. celebrating 14 years on planet earth as my daughter Happy so birthday! You forgot Google turned 25 yesterday. Yeah, you posted that. You posted that. Some yeah, good yeah. some good screenshots from back in the day. Do you remember when you first used Google? I do. And I also remember my executive director asking me, what the fuck is a Google? Mm -hmm. That was funny. Why, why are you spending so much time on Google? I'm like, because it's the fucking shit. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> uh, if you want to take a look at new and cool tech, well, mm -hmm. we've got events to talk about. First off, I want to I, I want to talk about one past event. Shout out to Jim for having us at their virtual talent su summit where we discussed uh, embracing the AI shift, the evolution of TA with um, Dr. Mona Sloan. She's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. EEOC Commissioner Sonderling. Love that guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the day of the event, we had 2,300 people watch the discussion for an average of 43 minutes. It was a 53 minute long presentation. 40, that just blew my mind. So needless to say, there's an amazing appetite for the top of, topic of uh, AI. You can go to the GEM website and watch it today or wait 
and we will be dropping it in probably about 30 days or so on our YouTube channel. That's right. That's right. That's right. Let's talk a little Damn, football, wait Chad. A Boats although, and Hose is in Vegas, baby. Although... <laughs> We've got HR Tech in Vegas. We're going to be hanging out at the Fuel 50 booth at the Expo Hall. Come visit us. Bring a six-pack some snacks, get a selfie, maybe get yourself a t-shirt and, uh, you know, take a selfie with our dumb asses. Then, oh my God, we're going to go to Unleash World in Paris. Uh, we're going to be right, in the right, text kernel right. booth on day one. Stop by. Uh, right. I think Joel is arranging a wine and cheese plate. If I could get a charcuterie board, Joel, that would be amazing. <laughs> uh, then, then I'm going to be chilling like a villain in the Algarve until early December when I head off to London. That's London, England, kids, not London, Ohio, for TA Tech Europe. So if you're in the UK, hell, if you're in the in Europe, hop on a plane, train, or the tube and come and see me at TA Tech Europe. See it, say it, sorted at chadcheese.com slash events. Register. Go to London to see a far more relaxed and happy Chad Sowash Fuck in Europe. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about fantasy football, although it hurts my heart uh, to, to talk about the leaderboard this week after losing a humiliating uh, week to you. Uh, thanks for playing, Joe Burrow. Appreciate that. Gotcha. Could have sat out, but he didn't. All right, here's here's your leaderboard. As you all know, fantasy football is sponsored by our friends at Factory Fix. Number one for the week goes to Marcy Playground Mall. Number two (laughs) is Smokin' Joe Dixon, followed by Michelle Despicable Meehan. Number four, Brent Musburger Losey. Chad making strides to number five at Chad fucking Keenan Allen. So wash. (laughs) Dean Ospot Osner. Number six, seven, Funky Cold Medina Perro. Number eight, Jill went up a hill, Patterson. Number nine, f- from out of the cellar, Jasper the Friendly Ghost, Spanjart. Number 10, <laughs> Kristen Kringle Urban. Number 11, Joel Ropadope Cheeseman. That's right, I'm just lulling everyone to sleep before I make my move. And number 12, again, Dennis, it's getting comfortable down here, Tupper. Rounds That's out. Michelle Sargent. That's the second week in a row you got her name wrong. Michelle, what did Michelle I say? Sargent. Not Meehan. Oh. She's she's our other friend over at Plum. But no, it's Michelle oh. Sargent. Sorry about that, Michelle. I I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, what kind of nickname am I going to do for that? Okay. Uh, we'll come back <laughs> next week for that. Sorry. Sorry. Clearly, I need a break in, in Europe as well. Yes, Maybe you do. Well. All right. Looking for... Topics! All right, Chad, let's have a little UAW strike update, or just strikes in general seem to be uh, spreading around mm-hmm. around the world. A uh, little few updates here, and we can comment. Biden became the first sitting president to join an auto worker strike. Uh, Trump spoke to a non-union auto factory. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Fain, uh, the UAW boss, hates Trump, but isn't yet endorsing Biden. By the time you hear this, the strike has likely expanded to other mm-hmm. cities. Uh, there probably or there are more layoffs, and there probably will be more as time uh, goes by. Tesla shareholders are apparently a little nervous. The stock is down 7% mm-hmm. in the last week as shareholders are fearful that Tesla workers will get uh, a little squirrely and, so and unionized the on their own. Yeah, uh-huh. and uh, the Hollywood strike is over. Uh, that might be air quotes. Uh, we can talk about that. And Vegas service workers, that's in Las Vegas, are striking, although details are a little sparse at the moment. Just in time for us to go to Vegas, that could be a lot of fun if all the service workers <laughs> are striking in Not Las cool. Vegas. Chad, any thoughts on all the striking going down? Yeah, I think so. SAG after I think you know everybody was was uh, predicting that this was just going to drag out until you know everybody ran out of money, yep. and uh, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because uh, the the I think the the big names uh, were lulled to sleep and thinking that they had enough content to wait this out, and then they looked behind them and thought, "Holy shit, Netflix is pulling all this content from all over the world." It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, wasn't us content, but it was great mm-hmm. content. 
and they have a pipeline and we don't have a pipeline. Fuck. So they got outflanked to, to some extent, but I think this is, this is a nice, I think, indicator for, for, for unions, right? This, this is, we still need a collective voice. And when you see a lot of these uh, companies, when they're talking about the union, they're trying to break unions up so that you don't have that, that, that power, that, mm-hmm. that total consolidated one voice, hundreds, thousands of people in one voice kind of power. Uh, they don't want that. They want to be dealing with you one by one in their office. So it, it's interesting. I think it's incredibly interesting that last week you said that, that there's going uh, Sean Fain was playing a political card. Well, mm-hmm. if he was, he he laid all that shit down on the on the on the flo- on the deck because uh, Biden was there. Trump wanted to be there, and he told him to fuck off. Yeah. Yeah, he he is definitely. If I were him, I would have kept Trump at least in the purview of saying, "Hey, whichever one of you idiots can get us the deal that we want, at least put it out there that we're going to be supporting you as president uh, in the next election." He's basically taken Trump off the table. Trump talking to a non-union uh, shop. <laughs> I don't even know what to think about. It was like why, I mean, all, like the signs that people are holding up were like. Pro union. I was just really weird, and nobody was a u- in the in the union. In, no, in, no, no, that yeah. was just weird. I, it was that was all optics. I don't even know what to think about that. But he's clearly put his cards uh, with Biden. Maybe Biden has told him, "Hey, look, we're going to get this done. I'm going to get your 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 folks what they need." And if Biden can do that, I think he's the next president because I do still think that the auto workers, particularly in the states where they operate, Michigan in particular, mm-hmm. are are swing states. Uh, to put whoever gets them what they want into the White House. So hopefully Biden has what he wants. Biden's, you know, Biden was there for like not a long time. There wasn't a lot of Q&A. It was like show up, get photos, sound, say your sound bites and get the hell out of town. The real the real pudding will be in that is, is if this deal gets done. Uh, if Biden hopefully is behind the scenes working with this, the car makers and the union, like how do we get this done and, and promising things in the future? So I still think that's on the table. Um, and as soon as the deal gets done, if they get what they want, they're going to endorse Biden. They're going to put all the workers uh, or at least tell the workers that that's who they should vote for. Um, really interesting that Tesla is, is concerned about unionization. They've, I think, strategically gone to states where unions are not really welcome. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. Uh, those are mostly right to work states, so you don't have to join a union, as as I understand it. So we'll see mm-hmm. what happens. But if if union workers see, uh, you know, f- the big three get uh, twenty dollars more an hour, there's going to be a little bit of pushback um, on that. Ultimately, automation is going to take a lot of this stuff, which I think is this is the time to move on more on more funds. Um, automation is going to continue to happen. Offshoring or nearshoring to Mexico is going to continue to happen. So right now is the time. For the auto workers to get what's theirs they've been fucked over and since we've been alive mm-hmm. uh chad and uh you know good on them i hope that they they do that uh without bankrupting the the auto auto companies which may They're happen regardless of whether or not dude. they That's do so much bullshit yeah we'll see. The fucking we'll see companies go out of business i don't know i don't think it'll be the workers though it'll be It'll be Tesla that does Tesla and Toyota. It is um, it is pretty amazing that Chrysler was bought by Fiat years ago and they were not turning a profit. Mm-hmm. And it took, I think, less than two years for Fiat to actually get them to turn a profit. Yeah. Americans are supposed to be good at this shit. Guess what? Apparently we're not. Pissing me off, man. We're horrible. America's <laughs> horrible. America's horrible. Fuck. We- Hollywood strike. Uh, great. It was... Uh, also notice I didn't uh, put it out there, but Governor Gavin Newsom in California, uh, they wanted regulations to put drivers in auto, uh, driverless automobiles and some regulations out there, which he said no to. So you're seeing a little bit of back and forth with, with what's going on in California. The Vegas thing is going to be interesting. Uh, I can't imagine Vegas if this all the service workers go on strike it's going to be a meltdown uh in vegas if something like that happens so we'll be watching that as well overall labor labor's having a moment uh whether it's ups getting what they want some are winning you need leverage to get what you want um yep. some are like head fakes i think the google 
uh, tech unionization has been sort of a, a dud. We, we talked about grinder workers getting unionized and we'll see what happens there. But union is unionization and unions are having a moment. Um, it's fun to talk about some some with leverage are winning others uh, not so much but they definitely are thinking that we need to get ours because we've been getting effed over with inflation rising and everything else going on we need to get paid and this is a reaction to all that stuff oh, and ups in a very smart way got their people back to work because why what what, what time of the year is it joel Christmas, the holidays, yeah, seasonal, packages. Baby. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yep. And we continue to talk about companies hiring. I know uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, dicks.com, one of your favorite sites. I know, Chad, okay. uh, you got to go out there for that. And uh, yeah, companies are announcing a lot of seasonal hiring. So that's that's all great. Also, a lot of generative AI news uh, yes. out there, Chad, which we want to talk about. Some bumps in the AI, AI road this week. However, uh, Amazon, who is mass hiring, uh, who should also be able to develop some homegrown AI, is investing $4 billion in AI firm Anthropic to compete in the AI industry and enhance generative AI for its online platform, Amazon.com. Chad, what are your thoughts on Amazon's big bet on Anthropic? So OpenAI plus Microsoft, they have ChatGPT. Google has Bard, and now Anthropic plus Amazon, they have Claude. Who the fuck is naming these chatbots? This is, there's no way in hell that marketing had anything to do with the naming. And when Bard is the best name of them all. It might be employ based on their webinar titles. They might yeah, be the yeah, ones yeah, naming yeah. all these AIs. That's a very good point. Anyway, 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 I guess they aren't sweating the small naming stuff because um, the big stuff is the competition with other cloud businesses. Uh, this was inevitable as cloud providers like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon will make loads of cash offering companies currently using their cloud infrastructure to easily adopt generative AI. Amazon doesn't want a huge client leaving AWS for Google Cloud because Google can provide a shit hot product that Amazon can't. So Claude mm -hmm. was already available in AWS before this, but this cements Anthropic's focus on their new sugar daddy, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the enterprise side of the house. On the transactional side of the house, you know Google and Amazon want to drive more purchase purchases through their mm -hmm. platform, and generative AI can help with better shopping uh, recommendations and results. It's all about getting that stuff that people are yearning for in front of them so that they, they spend the dollar. So uh, it will be interesting to see how Facebook and Elon Musk compete with these, uh, these, these gigantic organizations. Yeah. Look, 4 billion is no joke. That's a lot of money. I don't know. I don't know the terms of the deal, uh, but certainly they're, they're getting in bed uh, with, with Anthropic in a big way. I think where the, where the, the benefit to Amazon comes from is that, uh, Claude says it ensures speedy and friendly resolution to customer service request, saving costs and increasing customer satisfaction. So if you look at something that Amazon needs and can mm -hmm. get better at, it's that customer service piece. And by the way, this could help eliminate some human beings from the customer service uh, department, which obviously saves Amazon a ton of money. Amazon also has to worry about Shopify. Um, a lot of a lot of retailers and people who just sort of sell uh, you know, Etsy type sellers mm -hmm. are looking at their own stores. Uh, Shopify is having a moment. Amazon wants to keep those folks on their platform. This is a way to sort of help them do that. If they can create yeah. their own customer service product for their, for their uh, store owners, that's obviously a big plus. And if they keep it out of the hands of Shopify, they stick it to a competitor uh, in the process. So to me, it makes sense. Hopefully Eventually, if there is an acquisition, they're going to get the get the talent that's at Anthropic and add extra value. Uh, the AWS play, I think, is really interesting as well. How much does this play into that product? Mm -hmm. I know there's some talk about spinning off AWS from the Amazon platform. Does Anthropic become an arm of AWS and AI solutions that you can plug in uh, your business into that? So I think it's a pretty smart buy. Time will tell. It's a lot of money, uh, but it is certainly where things are going 
Uh, so thumbs up for me, at least on uh, Amazon's move into AI. Amazon is not the only one, though, Chad, that's having a moment with oh, generative yeah. AI. On the job <laughs> search front, an industry vendor alerted us to the fact that his site has temporarily scrapped their chat GPT-like job search because it, quote, wasn't producing the results that users needed, end quote. Chad, your thoughts on this impact on the job board industry? Okay, people, I, I appreciate the attempt, but you have to remember that AI is like a puppy. It's going to shit on the carpet until it's trained not to. So you're going to get shitty search results right out of the gate. But if you want to see something that's actually working, Google is augmenting their traditional search with generative AI, not making it one option, right? Just being able to, to add it as a part of the experience. Um, then you take a look at Google's Bard, which is now in Gmail, Drive, Docs, Calendar, etc. That product is going to be shit mm -hmm. for about six months while it trains. So vendors and users, remember, AI is like a puppy. Feed it, clean up after it, just keep training it and don't give up. That's, you, you can't expect out of the gate that generative AI is going to be shit hot. It's going to take some time, kids. I think you're saying it's not 100%, Chad. 60% of the time, it works every time. If you're lucky, 60% yeah, of the time. Yeah, in addition to that, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I didn't do a search with their solution. I can mm. kind of visualize what it looked like. In addition to the results and what you're going to get back, you know, people, uh, people don't like change. And we've spent 25 years training them on what a job board is supposed to do. You're supposed mm -hmm. to put in a search query, a location, click go and see results. You mentioned Google earlier in the show, and you and I are old enough to remember when Google first came out. The brilliance of Google was that it wasn't Yahoo. It wasn't a bunch of links, a bunch of banner ads, a bunch of flashing lights mm -hmm. uh, with the job search box being kind of hidden with everything else. You went to Google, it was Google and a box and it. search or I feel lucky. That was that was the extreme of what they did outside the box. <laughs> yeah, even later, right? Like, yeah. Depending how far, how far you go back. But yeah. they knew that no one has any idea what this is. We need to make it as simple as possible. They only have one thing to do type something in and go search and job boards have spent 25 years training people on this is what you do on a job mm. search site right if you throw some chat gpt stuff at them they're <laughs> going to be a little bit freaked out and and confused and yes. it's not like they don't have other options they can just click the back button on google and go to the next site you know in, in the search results yeah so if you're gonna like retrain job seekers redo your site in terms of what that all looks like, you have to tread real lightly on what's going on and ease into it, Chad. You know, don't get late on the first date. Buy buy your visitors a drink or two mm -hmm. to get them acclimated to what's going on. I think it's probably the future where this is going, or just we're gonna do the search for you. Like put in sales and we're gonna yeah. chat GPT this thing and kind of do it for you. But don't freak people out. It's just too much too soon yeah. for a lot of them. Give them what they're used to, but then give them a little advance copy, sure. right? And and that's exactly what Google, if you're if you're using the uh, Google Labs version of the Google search, you'll see that uh, the BARD generative AI is already in the search, but it doesn't change your experience. It just adds to the experience. Yep. And for listeners of this show, you know, this is the time where we take a break to hear from our sponsors and please listen to the ads because there is no show without them. We'll be right back. All right, Chad, let's talk images. And you know what I'm talking okay. about. 
I Getty Getty Images is partnering mm -hmm. with Nvidia or Nvidia, sorry, to launch generative AI allowing users to create images using Getty's vast licensed photo library with full copyright protection. The tool is based on Nvidia's Edify model and can generate realistic human figures, but has limitations on certain image types and real world names. Generated images won't be added to Getty's libraries and creators will be compensated if their AI generated images are used for training. The tool is available separately from standard Getty images subscriptions with pricing based on prompt volume. Chad, your thoughts on the latest move by Getty images. Yes. Acquisition, acquisition, acquisition. That will be the path for many of these companies to drive the next generation of their business. Why? Because Getty is using their massive database of art and photos of which they own and or they share with, with uh, obviously licenses and using AI to generate variations of those works. But the models only train off of what Getty currently owns. So if Getty has a bigger database of content through acquisition of companies like Shutterstock, Pexels, iStock, and others, the ability to create better and more variants go through the fucking roof. So this is a model for the next generation. Access more data, build bigger databases for models mm -hmm. to train off of, and continue adding content slash data to those models. Could be pictures, libraries of books, film scripts. And, po and the possibilities just keep coming. So it's exciting to see, but it's also alarming because the companies with the most money will have the best computing power. Like you said, NVIDIA. It costs uh, $40,000 to get one, one of NVIDIA, NVIDIA's newest GPU chips, yeah. right? And most of those we saw and we reported on a, a few weeks ago are going to the big players, yeah. right? So if you're a little guy, it's going to be incredibly hard to break through. You're not going to have the computing power. You're not going to have the money for acquisition unless you're in a niche domain like some of the vendors in our space and you've already been training models for years and you've been training and you have data that's automatically flowing into your system from candidates, from uh, employers, et cetera, et cetera. So it depends. Yeah. But in some of, these, some of these models, it's going to be incredibly hard for smaller organizations to compete. Yeah, I would say the number of organizations that have the money to to create these models mm -hmm. is very limited. Uh, yeah. the The rule of law is what's going to come into play for all these cases. We talked about uh, the New York Times walling off their content. Uh, there's a lawsuit, uh, I think, this week from a lot of authors uh, that are popular that have basically sued open AI and any kind of generative AI from taking the content of their books and basically coming to a point where they could rewrite new books by Michael Crichton in his voice, yeah. create entirely new works based on what he's already done. And he's not even involved. Uh, images is, is another one. Um, Dolly is, is open AI's image producer. Yeah. If Getty starts lose, if you can just make an image of Tom Cruise on a plane you don't need to go to Getty Images or any other photo, op, you know, photo app. So I don't think they have the money to create their own. I think this is a lot of head fake to say, look, we're building this ourselves. We're walling things off when in their back of their minds, they know the chances of them winning a court case or winning the court case that says open AI has to pay. Um, and this, this all goes back to the fair use laws that are in place that basically say you can take a snippet of something you can't take the entire thing. OpenAI thinks they can. We'll see what the law thinks. We talk about Google on this show. When you search Google, the number of characters that you see in a search result, mm. if they go past that, they start treading the line of, of violating fair use laws. Right. So there's going to be a court case probably next year that says no OpenAI, they can't do this without compensating, which is probably where it's going. And then they're going to have to figure out a model where everyone gets paid just like yeah. music and everything else and everybody will be happy. Uh, but until then, I think these companies are saying, how do we close this off? How do we scare open AI um, to get what we want? But ultimately it's going to come to the courts and how they, uh, how they resolve this is going to be judiciously not opening up the banks, uh, bank accounts and the wallets to create their own stuff. Cause they don't have the pockets to do that, let alone authors, 
people like you and me with a podcast, uh, you know, if, if we're going to train AI, AI, do we get paid? Should we get paid? And how much mm -hmm. we get paid is what's going to, what it's going to come down to, I think. Exactly. And then we just saw news that Spotify is going to do what Chad and she's a bit and been doing for months. They're going to clone voices and they're going to start flipping those English and or other uh, languages into additional foreign languages. I mean, yeah, again, you know, we we were first to do this shit, but, uh, you know, Spotify is going to make it easier. Such pioneers. Spotify is going to make it easier. But but <laughs> but yeah, Getty, if NVIDIA is pushing cash their way, they've got the AI operating system on top of those GPUs. I mean, th there, there's a good there's a good opportunity that's here there. Um, the big question is, who is there going to be? Let's say, for instance, a uh, acquisition of Getty by somebody like I NVIDIA or Google or, or what have you to be able to train their models because Google and Gemini is, is multimodal. So mm -hmm. that's the, that's the next big step, not just text, but being able to get into like a mid journey kind of scenario or Dahlia kind of scenario. I think the tech companies are going to pay. They're just going to have to. I, yeah, I agree. Whether, whether they like to get away with it or not. <laughs> All right, let's go to uh, another company that may have to pay or should be paying. Uh, LinkedIn. Yes. A story from Business Insider entitled, quote, it's not just you. LinkedIn has gotten really weird, end quote, caught our attention this week. Though traditionally a platform for professional networking and job-related content, LinkedIn has seen a surge in personal training, personal sharing and unconventional posts in recent years. The author says the shift towards personal sharing on LinkedIn can be attributed to evolving social norms, the blurring of work-life boundaries during the pandemic, and a generational shift among younger users who are more open about sharing their personal lives with colleagues. However, the trend has also sparked debates about what is considered professional behavior with some users pushing the boundaries of what is appropriate to share on a professional network. Chad, is LinkedIn getting too weird for your tastes? So a question for you, because you you believe in kind of like the buttoned up uh, pieces of, of the world, like, you know, the Senate and making sure that John Fetterman wears a suit. What do you, what do you think about this? Because you've been on plenty of different uh, social platforms. Yep. What, what do you think? Uh, so I think in the early days of LinkedIn, it was sort of considered buttoned up. It was work only things that re were relevant to work. Right. Keep your social stuff on Facebook. And now there's other things that you can put uh, fun things on. I think what really changed that, I don't think it's as much the pandemic or younger people getting on um, LinkedIn. In my opinion, when when Facebook and TikTok became algorithmic, became Here's stuff for you that isn't necessarily stuff that you signed up for, but we're going to mm -hmm. serve it to you because we know your behavior. We know you like World War II history. We know yeah. you like big booty Latinas. We know you like bug fights. <laughs> like, so these, the social networks that just be, that used to be, Hey, what's Chad doing? Hey, what's my sister doing? Hey, what's my dad? Up? Like that. That's sort of out the window. I get very little content about, you know, what I want to see and people who I follow. So the default for that now is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is now, oh, what, what are people that I hang out at conferences or follow up companies? What are they doing? And it's mm -hmm. less about share an article from uh, The Economist and more about what's going on. I think that work has become more social. I think LinkedIn has become the place because there's nowhere else to go for sort of, here's just people you follow and what they're doing or companies that you follow. The minute that LinkedIn becomes, hey, we're just going to serve you stuff that we think that you like based on your preferences, then then where do you go? I don't know. Maybe like just little networks or groups. But uh, I don't I, I just I think it has more to do with just we have nowhere else to go uh, that we can decide what we what we look at and see than LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Um I'm all for it. I'm all like, I'm here, you know, you and me on this podcast, we don't have bosses. We are who we are and yep. we bring that to LinkedIn and people like that authenticity. They like that, um, that we are who we are. And I think that that is really what's coming out on LinkedIn. I don't think it's weird at all. Um, now the creepy stuff with dudes hitting on women and you know, that stuff, 
is probably way out of bounds and sh- shouldn't be happening no yes. matter what. But just the typical, hey, what are you doing with your kids? Or what's you're on holiday? Like I don't. That doesn't matter. I'm cool with that because I, these work people are friends, and I want to see what what they're doing on a personal level. It's like Joe Shaker always says: make a friend, make a deal. You can make friends a lot easier and make deals a lot easier in that way if you're yourself on LinkedIn and not some buttoned up caricature of what you think people want to see. Yeah, I don't know why some people feel like they have to please other people, right? I mean, it's it's it comes down to, especially in, in this, in, in LinkedIn or any social media, you can defriend anybody. Mm-hmm. You can hide some content in, in some social platforms. Um it's not like this guy was trying to, you know, spread propaganda to fix an election or anything. I mean, this isn't Cambridge <laughs> Analytic, Analytica. Um, if you don't agree, comment and, you know, start a conversation. If it's a troll, unfriend them. You know, mm-hmm. too much thought and effort is taken by people who don't work at LinkedIn on the subject. Let LinkedIn worry about this kind of shit, right? Their user, their, 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 their usage, not to mention you take a look at a, a lot of people who actually left Twitter because they didn't like what it was, it was turning into. Maybe they didn't want to pay. Maybe they didn't like, you know, Elon's shenanigans. Well, they need an outlet to be able to do these things. They're familiar with LinkedIn, right? So I think for us, it's it's fairly simple. Just be who you are and allow other people to be who they are. And, you know, if you disagree or you'd like to challenge mm-hmm. people, do that. That's that. There, there's nothing wrong with that. But also be ready to be <laughs> defriended. Um, yeah. And, and that's all good. Yeah. I think I think what you and I don't appreciate is, you know, people who do have a job, people who do have a boss, people who do have a brand that they represent. And there's a line that they can't cross or don't think that they can cross. The good news is more and more companies are letting people be themselves and mm-hmm. they realize that that is a good thing. Like that's okay. People aren't going to launch bombs and grenades online. They're just going to be people. And that's what your company's made up of. So I think as companies get more used to it, people are getting more used to it. And articles like this are being written because people are letting their hair down and be who they are. But there is a limit of being who you are, Chad. And our friend Tyree <laughs> Kill. <laughs> <laughs> is is treading on that line. We'll talk about him right after the break. That's right, Chad. Some of us want to retire to Portugal. Mm-hmm. Many of us may never retire. But one NFL wide receiver has a unique perspective on life after football. Mm-hmm. Miami Dolphins wide receiver Tyreek Hill recently surprised fans by revealing his desire to pursue a career in the adult film industry after retiring from football. I- During a Twitch stream with fellow NFL player Mike Evans, Hill expressed his aspiration to become a porn star and asked Evans for his opinion. What are you doing, step bro? Evans seemed unsure how to respond to Hill's statement. Something Uh tells me you, you might have a response, Chad. (laughs) So I watched the video uh, of all of this happening, like the, the Twitch video. And uh, I really thought at first that Hill was fucking with Evans. Uh, Evans didn't know what to say. I mean, he was like really <laughs> taken aback. He was like, uh, I mean, th- there was this long, really uncomfortable pause. And yep. Hill was like, what, you don't think so? I mean, c- come on. So I-, I almost think that he was fucking with him. Yeah. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, allow Tyreek Hill to do Tyreek Hill. Much like we were talking about on LinkedIn. You uh-huh. do you on LinkedIn. Okay, Tyreek Hill, you do you in life. Yep, yep. <laughs> I got two words, uh, two words, Chad. VR and AI. A day is coming where we can watch anyone, famous or not, do the dirty online with AI. And if you want the sensation of actually having sex with said person, there's going to be a VR headset with your name on it. The good news. So creepy. Tyreek can go ahead and license his image for some virtual freaky deaky and hope the courts uphold that license. Chad, <laughs> I sense you and I will not have similar opportunities to license our image for such pleasantries. Did I mention that I may or may not be wearing pants for this episode? We out. We out. So creepy. Thank you for listening to what's it called? A podcast with Chad.
The cheese. Brilliant. They talk about recruiting. They talk about technology. But most of all, they talk about nothing. Just a lot of shout-outs of people you don't even know. And yet, you're listening. It's incredible. And not one word about cheese. Not one. Cheddar. Blue. Nacho. Pepper Jack. Swiss. There's so many cheeses and not one word. So weird. Anywho, be sure to subscribe today on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. That way, you won't miss an episode. And while you're at it, visit www.chatcheese.com. Just don't expect to find any recipes for grilled cheese. It's so weird. We out!